Imperialism mutates its forms and language, but remains unassailable in Africa and countries such as India. The old face of white colonial masters, including the British Raj, has been modernized. Financial institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, have seized control of the local economies, disempowering local elites as effectively as they did in the past. Why do those who live in nations rich in natural resources, such as the Congo, continue to live in misery? Why are the levels of income inequality so huge? And why is war and violence endemic in many states in Africa? We look at the new iteration of global imperialism with Lee Wengraff, author of Extracting Profit, Imperialism, Neoliberalism, and the New Scramble for Africa. So I want to talk a little bit about how historically we got to this point uh, in Africa. Um, very similar situation to the Middle East in that uh, it was the Berlin Conference, right, where mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the case of uh, the Middle East uh, it was Sykes-Pico, but you have in colonial powers drawing the map. <laughs> Talk a little bit about how Africa set the historical roots, how it was deformed by colonial powers. Yeah, so, uh, well, thanks, Chris, for having me. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Berlin Treaty of 1884 uh, literally set the stage for the carve-up by the great colonial powers, Britain, France, Belgium, Germany, and so on, to really literally redistribute uh, land and territory. Spheres of influence. Spheres of influence, have. exactly, between, between the great powers. And by the end of the 19th century, virtually uh, it's around 90% of, of the continent was colonized. And so there was, in a very short period of time, over the course of decades, uh, Africa went from a continent which had emerging nation states, which were beginning to develop their own uh, sort of their own independent trade and economies and so on, really uh, went in a fairly rapid period of time into uh, being subjects uh, under colonial rule. And we should also just back up a little bit historically mm -hmm. because, what is it, 10 million, an estimated 10 million Africans had been shipped, captured, kidnapped as slaves. Right, uh, absolutely. So, and uh, my book uh, discusses a little bit of the contribution, the immense contribution of Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, which is uh, a seminal work really for understanding the 500 year trajectory um, of. Of that, of that process, how beginning with the slave trade uh, and then continuing into the colonial and then the post-colonial era, uh, European forces, colonial forces, imperial forces, uh, it essentially underwent a process of underdeveloping, of reversing the development and now reversing in, in more recent years industrialization on the continent. Which is a D, to write about it, but it's, uh, I, which I didn't know, but there's been a de-industrialization of Africa. I wasn't aware of. That's exactly right, and that's one of the uh, one of the goals that I aim to do with the book is to really demonstrate both uh, historically and empirically how that process has unfolded, and really to provide some of the data to show that the recent African boom has been accompanied by a process of deindustrialization and really class polarization, and massive well, it's mirrored, increase it's of poverty. It's mirrored the rest of the world. I mean, create, enriching as colonialism did, a kind of uh, native aristocracy that's willing to do the bidding of the colonial powers or our new colonial powers, the World Bank and the IMF. Um, and then there is, this, there is no middle class. There is this vast disparity in wealth. What you can see unfolding across the continent in which uh, the colonizers introduced infrastructure, railways, roads, uh, this type of thing. But it was purely in the interest of extracting profit, which is, you know, and the reason why I chose that as a title of my book is in part because I wanted to echo that prior era extraction, the removal at the, uh, at the expense of uh, human labor, the exploitation of, uh, of the environment, of literally African society. Well, and there was a conscious effort on the part of colonial powers, and Eduardo Galeano writes this about this in Latin America, which was the same process, where these were natural resource rich countries, um, and the colonial powers, as is true today, they want those natural resources, and uh, they want to extract them 
uh, without, uh, without any kind of control. And so they were, it was quite a conscious process of keeping these societies from developing, that this wasn't an accident. That's right. And, but I, th I think that that has to be seen in conjunction with the underdevelopment of Africa is inseparable from the rising uh, and the sort of ascension to imperial status of the great powers of Europe. I mean, really, you have to say that Britain. Well, this is Karl Marx. He got it. <laughs> uh, absolutely. He did I mean, get it. Karl Marx uh, identified it correctly. Uh, Walter Rodney sort of takes that as a jumping off point to do a real kind of deep dive, as we might say today, into what that process looked like. And Rodney, Rodney argues, and I think this is absolutely right, that uh, Britain's rise as the great industrial power of the, uh, in particularly in the 18th and 19th century, would have been impossible without the African slave trade. And then uh, following from that, uh, the, uh, the extraction of other resources that continued to happen after the partition, uh, the, the, the carve up of Africa, gold and rubber and so on, and other natural resources. So it's important to see this as part of a systemic whole, that it's not just the underdevelopment of, of Africa, but really the advancement and the, um, the rise to power of, of, of the great imperial powers. And again, I think that that process is very much true today. Um, the character of it has changed. Um, and so... Well, let's talk about that.